originally intended to be an education slash information session uh, to start to engage people in the community, provide a little bit of background information on this new thing called Opportunity Zones. Uh, that there's been, you know, over, at times over the last year quite a bit in the press about, but really in, in terms of real information, it's been a little slow in coming. Uh, really just kind of taking hold now. So we wanted to have a session where we bring uh, different components of the community together to kind of talk about what it is, what it might be able to do, uh, some of the positives, some of the drawbacks, etc., about this new tool that, that has come to us. Those of you who have been following the, the whole Opportunity Zone saga, it is really something that's been around for like a year now. Uh, it was one of the components of the uh, jobs, of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of, of, of last year, 2017, right at the end of the calendar year. And then it was kind of in limbo. Uh, it was passed by Congress, the President signed it, and then there really wasn't a lot of information, there was a lot of speculation about what might be included, about how it might operate, about how it might work, but not really much in the way of, of solid information until this fall. In October, uh, some guidance came down from the federal level, uh, so that has really kind of put things in gear, but there still are some pieces that are being learned. There's still some components that aren't fully uh, out there for the public, so uh, it's a learning process for all of us. But, um, we will learn a lot this afternoon, and again, this, this is not intended to be the, the ultimate treatise on this topic. This is really kind of 101 on Opportunity Zones, just to give people a sense of what it is, uh, and, and, and really from a broad sense, because this, this session is really intended to appeal to a broad spectrum of people uh, trying to get that basic information out, and those of you in the audience probably will have completely different sets of questions because you're looking at it from a different perspective. And that's what this is about, is to kind of get those out, uh, to have an opportunity to learn as a, as a community, as a group, and then take it from there. What we're, again, as we're going, how we're gonna do this is we're going to have a couple of presenters that, that, are, that are, are subject matter experts who are going to give us a, a really good background. And I'm looking at them and they're smiling. So hopefully they agree that they're going to give us a really good background. Uh, and then we'll move into the panel discussion. But, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our, our two presenters who are going to be kind of the core piece of, of this presentation this afternoon. Uh, and we're really pleased to have them both. Uh, and they are Jeff Jewell, who was the National uh, Development Council, and Jordan Victor, who is the Kansas, with the Kansas Department of Commerce. And they'll talk to us kind of in different ways about it, and kind of a different perspective on, on this whole idea of opportunity zones, what they can do, what they might be able to do in a community like Lawrence. And then following that, we'll have a panel discussion. They'll be involved. We'll have some other folks from the community involved. And there we'll have a chance to kind of address maybe some questions uh, that we've already preset, some ideas that, to get out and kind of touch on some specific issues. And then there'll be an opportunity for the, the rest of the audience to maybe bring your questions to the fore so we can all kind of learn about this and, and explore and enjoy it together. So without further ado, I'd like Jeff Jewell to come up and, and give us a crack on. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, so my name is Jeff. Uh, I'm actually a field director with the National Development Council. And the National Development Council, we are a national nonprofit that has worked for 50 years, actually 2019 is our 50th anniversary, to uh, serve and bring capital into underserved low-income communities. Uh, that's what we've been doing for 50 years, and so we provide technical assistance to communities. We also have a line of different development services and financing tools that we try to bring into our client communities when, when appropriate to try to bring capital. So whenever there is a new program that kind of comes online, um, as an organization, we begin to take a very critical look at how these tools can help uh, benefit our in our communities that we are working in. So, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, you know, the Opportunity Zones really started to get a lot of buzz um, in late 2017. And, uh, uh, and, we'll, and we'll kind of talk about the history of that and kind of how, how the program has evolved. But just as a little bit of a roadmap for where we're going to go, I'm going to be talking a little bit about background Opportunity Zones and how they function and how they work. And I'm going to ask Jordan to come up here and talk a little bit about 
complex payments process. We will go about more of these opportunities that were designated by the state of Kansas. And we're going to be talking about some community strategies and some kind of things that you should be thinking about. And then we're going to kind of pull that into the uh, larger panel discussion. So um, bear with me here while we try to get through this. Uh, so as Steve mentioned, the, the Opportunity Zones kind of came about with the, with the big tax bill that was passed at the end of 2017. Um, this bill was kind of thought about as a, as a big tax reform and tax cut package, which is true, but uh, there was a little insertion there at, at the very end of the bill. Um, the idea of Opportunity Zones had kind of been around for a while, uh, but they were never actually codified. And so at the end of 2017, as part of the tax bill that actually came into being, um, really lawmakers intended to increase investment in economically distressed areas, but this is a new program. So rules are still being promulgated. There was actually supposed to be a hearing uh, on this last month, but because of the shutdown, it was actually delayed until Thursday. So if you're interested in watching that, uh, that transpire, um, that's going to be happening on Thursday um, up, in, up in D.C. Uh, the different coalitions and organizations that have been kind of watching this and involved in it, including NBC, uh, have been issuing um, comments. Um, there have been about 140 different organizations that have been kind of commenting on this, on this rule to Treasury and to the IRS, asking for, asking for guidance. Because there really hasn't been a lot of clarity around it up until this point. Um, actually, as recently as last month in January, Congress sent a bipartisan letter to Treasury asking them to kind of expedite and pick up uh, their focus on this particular program began to kind of uh, really issue some more clarity around around the rules. Um, as Steve mentioned, kind of like the last big set of rules came out in the fall. Uh, we're still kind of digesting those and looking at them, uh, but they're supposed to do more and more guidance. But as he mentioned, we're kind of keeping it at high level today. Um, so you know, we'll we'll also be pointing you to some more resources as well. Um, this program is also somewhat different than other federal incentive programs. It's kind of like what we're calling a light touch regulatory program. Typically in uh, federal credit programs, incentive programs, you have some kind of agency that's getting in front of the incentive and the investor. Uh, this, in this particular instance, it's, it's pretty uh, direct to the investor. So we'll talk about that. We're kind of calling it this, 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 this light touch. But as I mentioned, opportunity zones are kind of supposed to unleash investment in local communities around the country. I think that there are a lot of good reasons why this will potentially happen, but you know there are also some things that considerations for public entities to be thinking about, I think, uh, in order to kind of amplify the benefits and mitigate any potential downsides that these that these uh, funds can have. So at its core, opportunity zones provide uh, preferential capital gains treatment for investments within designated low-income census tracts throughout, throughout the country. And they're working to defer, reduce, or completely eliminate capital gains uh, that are made within these particular low-income communities. So the tax incentive is actually going to be most valuable for those investments that are made for 10 years, at least 10 years. Um, and kind of what's different about this program is that it's, it's, it's an equity investment. And so it's different from other programs where debt is kind of the primary instrument. So to obtain the tax deferral, an investor has to actually make an equity investment in a qualified opportunity uh, zone fund. So it's not a debt instrument. So that, that's, a, that's a little bit different. But we're going to go into some more detail about that. At a very high level, um, an individual is going to uh, recognize the capital gain. So they're going to have some kind of uh, gain that they that they've realized through share of stocks, real estate, partnership interest, whatever it may be, they're going to take that gain and invest it into an opportunity fund. An opportunity fund, qualified opportunity fund, is an investment vehicle that's set up as a partnership or corporation for investing in qualified opportunity zones in businesses and properties. And we'll go into some more detail about that. But the opportunity zone fund needs to make these what are kind of called qual qual qualified investments. Um, but broadly, it's a stock partnership in a, in, a, in a business within an opportunity zone or a qualifying property within an opportunity zone. So this is kind of a, a, a graphical representation of how kind of maybe a, a, a portfolio opportunity fund would work. 
Um, the investor, again, recognizing that gain, placing the capital gain into an opportunity fund. In this particular instance, they're making, this opportunity fund is making qualified investments in three, in the three broad types of, of eligible investments. Qualified opportunities on business property, OZ partnership interests, or OZ stocks within qualified uh, businesses. Now there's a 90% asset test, so meaning that the opportunity fund has a certain amount of time to which it has to deploy 90% of its capital into one of these qualified investments. Um, if they're going to be making a qualified opportunity zone partnership interest investment or in OZ stock, for example, there's a 70% asset test, and all that, that means is that the 70-30 test means that uh, only if substantially all the business's tangible assets are located in the particular qualified in the opportunity zone, then that's a qualified opportunity zone business. So there's another little test there. Um, so if the 30% of the assets in the qualified opportunity zones can be outside of the qualified opportunity zone, just as long as 70% of that business is operating with it. So that was a kind of a complicated example of how a multi investment portfolio fund could work. Uh, but really, I think that we think that you know the simple way is really to create a fund because it is self-certifying. So individual investors, uh, through partnership or corporation, can actually create create uh, create a fund for self-certifying. We'll talk about that in a second. But really, at the end of the day, you know, we think that there's going to be an opportunity fund, and its only investment is going to be in one particular property or one particular business. So that's probably how the majority of them will be established initially. Though there are signals that. There are portfolio investments being created. There are some uh, real estate investment companies um, that, are, that, are, that are creating some funds as well, some impact investing funds as well, that are kind of creating these multi-investment um, and portfolio style um, investments. But to kind of keep it simple, we think that opportunity funds will just invest in one, in one, in one project. So what can investors expect? So the first benefit that I mentioned was, was, a, was a, a temporary deferral of uh, capital gains. So the investor can defer those capital gains until they exit the fund or December 31st, 2026, the earlier of the two. When they have held the, in, the particular investment in the fund for five years, they actually get a 10% reduction in their capital gains for that particular capital gain treatment. Um, if they hold it for an additional seven years, they actually get uh, an additional 5% discount. It's all uh, handled through steps up in basis of 10% and 15%. Um, so those, those increases in basis that are realized in years five and seven uh, reduce the capital gains that were, that were temporarily deferred uh, by 10 and cumulatively 15%. If the investment is held for years 10 and one day, this is kind of where the big benefit begins to be realized. So if they're going to hold the investment for 10 years, the gains accrued on that particular opportunity fund investment, any appreciation on that, those capital gains are actually forgiven and eliminated. Kind of show an example about how that, about how that works. So in addition to the 15% tax reduction, you're actually eliminating the capital gains on your investment within the opportunity fund. So, in the three benefits, deferral, tax reduction, and, and the elimination of taxes on, on the gains from the LZ investment. So this is an example investment of a $500,000 capital gain that's placed into a qualified opportunity zone fund. Again, for, for simplicity purposes, we're just showing capital gain treatment at the federal level. We're not including any kind of state impacts. We're just showing kind of how this works at the with the, with the, with the, with the, with the um, federal capital gains rate. So we, traditionally we would owe $119,000 on that particular gain, uh, but we're gonna go ahead and take that gain and put it into a qualified um, opportunity zone fund that's putting it into a qualified opportunity zone business, or in this particular example, a real estate opportunity. The investor's gonna earn a 7% return. And so this is kind of what it begins to look like for that particular five hundred thousand um, dollar, that particular five hundred thousand dollar investment. So, again, I've held it for five years. I've deferred my tax um, payment, my, my original capital gains payment. Um, stepped at my basis, received a, a ten percent 
uh, decrease. So I originally had owed 119,000. Now the tax that I owe in 2026, or whenever I've exited the fund, is uh, is 107,000 um, dollars. But I'm still going to owe tax on my appreciation in, in the OZ investment. So my after-tax funds are about 546,000 dollars. If I've held the investment for seven years, I'm going to get that 15 percent of reduction in, in the original capital gains tax that I owe. That I owe. Um, I'm going to owe normal capital gains on my any appreciation that I saw within that investment. So my after tax funds are going to come up to about 630000 about 3.3 percent internal rate of return. The 10 year investment. Okay, because I get the same tax treatment as I got in the seven year. So I've got my 15 percent uh, reduction in the capital gains. But now I'm not going to owe, because my investment appreciated by 7% annually over 10 years, I'm not going to owe any capital gains on that, on that appreciation. So I get my after-tax returns have significantly increased in this example. It's 5.9% 5. 5. or so. So these two examples kind of show what a fully taxed investment is held for 10 years like versus an investment into an opportunity zone. Again, we're just kind of walking through this to kind of show what, what, what the implications are. You know, I think that, and we'll, we'll probably talk about this later, but you know, the real kicker from this investment comes from kind of long-term investments that are held, and they have to perform over a long time in order to create any kind of significant value for the investor. So, same example, um, in, in, the left, in the left column, I've got my, my traditional investment, Pay my, my gain, my after tax funds invested for 10 years, appreciated 7% annually. I'm paying my capital gains on that appreciation. My after tax funds, 662000 or annual rate of return about 2.8%. And versus the opportunities on investment, you can see that it's you know, nearly 100%, um, nearly double the after tax returns. So um, those benefits, like I said, I really realized after being held for 10 years. Um, but that's, uh, that's kind of how it works from a, from a very only from a fellow perspective. So what do you invest in? Uh, you can really invest in a lot of things, uh, kind of broadly categorized as Cat 1, Cat 2. Um, tangible property, real property, land or improvements, equipment and or other personal property. Remember that uh, the tangible property needs to be in the opportunity zone for during substantially all of the funds holding period. Um, category two stocks, uh, category two investments are kind of the OZ stocks or partnership interests in businesses. Uh, clearly, you know, from the design and, and statute, Congress, we think, intended to uh, have investments go into operating businesses within, within zones. Because uh, investments in businesses is really kind of the only thing that really creates long-term economic benefits to the to the community, and operating businesses are, are, are a critical component for storing lasting growth and, and economic opportunity. I think at this time it's, it's kind of hard to tell how that will, how that will happen. Um, but we can put, but we'll, we'll sort of talk about that later. Uh, there are um, some deadlines for when. The transaction should have occurred, so there's no significant look backs, um, so you can't have recognized a gain a long time ago. Um, it has to occur after December 31st, 2017. And the property must be substantially improved during, during that 30 month period. So, as I mentioned, kind of the, these draft regulations have come out. Um, you know, actually, I just want to back up just one real. So, um, by statute, kind of certain businesses don't apply. It's kind of the typical um, businesses that are going to be excluded from any public programs, golf courses, country clubs, um, liquor stores, just things like that. Um, so that same, um, um, those same kinds of businesses will not be kind of considered qualified opportunity funds of businesses. If they, even if they meet all the other tests that are that are required, also um, the government wants to avoid opportunity zone funds flowing into businesses that are kind of of more speculative nature. Um, so they have a, uh, a requirement that less than five percent of the unadjusted basis is in non-qualified financial property. 
Um, so that's a particular rule that actually came out very recently. But as I mentioned, the draft regulations were released in 2018. So kind of we're looking at really like the only guidance that we have are particular revenue rulings that are coming out of the IRS or uh, updates to the FAQs that are coming out of the IRS. Um, they have actually issued as of October, and I, I don't think that they actually changed it in a recent revision very much, uh, but kind of a self-certification form itself. So as I mentioned, the qualified opportunity plan is an investment in the vehicle that's set up uh, for investing in eligible property. Um, it's form 8996, in case anybody's taking notes on where to find this. Um, but this is a form that's going to be used to certify uh, whether uh, a property is meeting um, the requirements that is, for example, 90% of the fund's assets are, are investing in the property, but to become a qualified opportunity fund, the investor simply certifies that um, it's an eligible corporation or partnership, and they self-certify by filing this form uh, with its federal income tax return. Okay, and There were some further clarifications around timing. Um, so uh, taxpayers have until June 30th, um, 2027, to make their investments and can actually uh, realize a 10-year benefit up until at least 2038. I think the program actually runs until 2048, but there's, there, there, there's some clarity around that particular issue. They also have some flexibility for timing to meet that 90% asset test and um, so qualified opportunity funds just have to certify by the end of the first year um, to measure their average assets held in six months of the date of the self certified So there's some flexibility in how they're going to be able to meet that 90% test. And then the working capital safe harbor, I mentioned that the project has 30, 30 months um, to deploy that capital uh, within an eligible project or an eligible business. So to qualify as a qualified opportunity zone business, either the original use of the property must begin with that zone fund, and its zone fund must substantially improve the property. And so what substantially improve, the statute says, it must invest as much in improving the property as it paid for the property in the first place, except for the value of land. Um, that's not included in the basis calculation. So for example, if a Qualified Opportunity Zone Fund bought an apartment building for $2 million. $1.5 million was attributed to the land uh, that the, the fund would only have to spend $500,000 on renovations and not $2 million. So the substantial rehab rule requires all, all Opportunity Zone investments to double the basis of the property uh, or the business uh, that the Opportunity Fund invests in. So this, I think, makes it really easy, probably, for new development, um, for real estate development. I think it makes it a little bit hard uh, for business investments. Um, so this is why we're kind of saying that, you know, I think that's a little bit unclear about whether there's new investments made into businesses, unless they're kind of early stage, or um, they're relocating or expanding in, in a particular zone. So I, I mentioned in some ways that opportunity zones are different than um, other investments. Um, primarily, you think that they're significantly more flexible um, because of the fact that they, they don't necessarily have to be tied to job outcomes. There's a variety of different projects that you could invest in. They're market driven, uh, which means that there's no real allocation. It's just really the appetite for whatever the opportunities are in that particular zone. So um, you don't, you're not relying on federal or state agencies to dole these out, unlike other um, incentives such as historic tax credits or new markets. You typically have intermediaries um, kind of funneling those, those particular investments. It's scalable, um, so there's no cap on the amount of benefit if regulations are followed. There's, you know, Estimates put at $6.1 trillion worth of unrealized capital gains out there. So you could theoretically have $6.1 trillion in new investment. I mean, that's, that's really an appetite for, like I said, for the opportunities within those funds, I'm sorry, within those zones. But 
Um, also, it is different because of no upfront subsidies or tax rates. So typically, tax credits are going to be put in near the beginning of a project, right? At near the beginning. Um, but these, in order for the investor to realize the benefits, really has to hold them, you know, at, at very degrees. But obviously, we will going to walk through that, uh, the different um, benefits are received in greater levels as the investment is realized and kind of held over time. So that's, that's a pretty significant change from other things like new market tax credits or or we got tax rates. And so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan so she can talk a little bit about kind of the stage role and how things to set up opportunity zones as well as hit on some other topics. Hi, I'm Jordan Bickford. I work with the Kansas Department of Commerce. Um, Commerce is the state's lead economic development agency. We house business development, community development, and workforce development. So working with opportunity zones was a natural fit for our agency. And I was lucky enough to know how to read tax statutes, so I got to be involved at a very early stage. Um, the statute does offer incentives for investment, and it is primarily a market and local driven program. There is very little role for the state carved out per statute or per regulation. So because the state has an interest in seeing investment come into these communities, we have decided to extend our role to a certain extent and try to engage with our communities to provide resources. So the real role for the state right now, um, first and foremost, we did designate the census tracts, um, the governor and the economic growth sub-cabinet to do that. And we'll go over the timeline of how that was established. Um, we're working to identify and align existing resources, programs, and policies to enhance investments in our opportunity zones, and that's kind of a cross-agency partners and communities, community foundations working together to kind of align those resources. Um, we are working to facilitate community collaboration. Um, some of that has been engaging in activities like this. Um, we also have regional project managers across the state who go out into the communities and identify some of the folks that are interested in seeing these investments. and. They've also been helping to build investment prospectuses, which we'll talk about a little bit more as we go forward. Um, and then in my office, we create and distribute resources for our communities to the best of our ability. We do have a website that links out to third-party resources. We have a map that we developed with um, an agency here on campus that you can kind of search and see where our communities are, where our census tracts are located. That's an interactive map that's available. Um, we also have a LinkedIn group page. Some of this program is going to be finding the folks who are interested and making those connections and sharing information. As Steve mentioned, there's been a lot of information out there, um, but really making the connections with the people who are going to be interested in your projects and your priorities is important. Um, so that's one space where you can talk to folks, and then we're also working on a My Sidewalk economic development dashboard, which will feature economic data across the state, the communities that have opportunity zones, and kind of focus on some of our key industries to try to attract investment into those areas. Um, I think a uh, big question is, how did we wind up with our opportunity zones designated across the state? Um, <clears throat> it was a pretty short timeline. Uh, the law was passed in December of 2017. The Treasury started reaching out to state contacts in January, and then in February, we went ahead and reached out to our communities. We announced um, that we would be accepting letters of interest from communities who wish to receive a nomination for designation as an opportunity zone. So we started getting those letters in from communities in February, and in March, we contacted the communities that were selected and worked with folks within the communities to prioritize which particular census tracts would receive the ultimate designations. Um, we submitted those in April to the Treasury Department. They had 30 days to return it, and lo and behold, they actually got their timeline, and then they, we got all of our census tracts. So um, as far as federal and state programs go, they don't normally run very quickly, but this has been a very quick process, and so there's a steep learning curve, and. Um, we have worked with our communities to focus on their priorities to the best of our ability. Um, so in those letters that we received, communities identified the needs present because these are all low 
low-income census tract across the country and across Kansas. So there are needs present, and then we also ask communities to identify some strategies and projects that they have ready to go to address some of those needs. Um, we ask them to identify which industries they would be focusing on. Um, because this is a really community-led program and a market-led program, and because the timelines are pretty tight for reaping all of the benefits, it was important that the communities put up their hands and said, we are a community that is ready to take advantage of these benefits. So the communities who came in, we were fortunate. We got 39 communities participating, and we were able to um, actually provide at least one census tract in each one of those communities across the state. Um, and as far as what they were identifying as projects and needs, we saw a lot of communities put up their hand and talk about affordable housing, um, not only for the workforce, but for their aging population. So those are um, some projects that we'll be seeing folks move forward with. And, uh, we'll be working with some communities on trying to address those needs and getting people who are working in the same sectors to work together on those. Um, food deserts is another huge priority for folks. Um, I know that we have one here in town. Um, we have another one that's been identified in southeast Kansas, and they are working on moving forward with a project using Opportunity Zone funds. Um, so we, we did consider the priorities of the communities. We also did consider the geographic location, poverty and unemployment rates. Um, engagement with education. We have five universities across the state that are now located within Opportunity Zone, so we hope that that'll try to funnel some funds towards those innovation districts and research and development efforts in those areas. Um, and then, again, further identification of specific projects. So we would have something to invest those, or to attract those investment dollars right after that. Um, so this is our map of Opportunity zones across the state. We have 74 census tracts across 35 counties and 39 communities. Um, this is home to 8.34 percent of the Kansas population, and um, it's 42 non-metropolitan or rural counties, 32 metropolitan opportunity zones. Um, Across the state, poverty rate is 12.8%. However, when you get into our opportunity zones, that rate goes up to 25.93%. Um, similarly, the unemployment rate across the state is 4.8%. And in the opportunity zones, that rate goes up to 8.7%. Um, so here in Lawrence, I'm going to bring it home. These are our designated census tracts. Um, we did get a letter from the city. Uh, asking to be nominated for designated census tracts. And uh, the first one is where we're sitting now. Um, it encompasses campus and us campus. Um, so this is one of our five universities. There's a planned research partnership zone in the southern section of this census tract. And the target use for this area, I mean, as flag at this point, is academic research, residential, and corporate partnerships. Um, in East Lawrence, this is actually one of the larger census tracts that we have in the state, um, besides Western Kansas, where some of those are full counties, but we can't compete with that. Um, so this track incorporates East Downtown, the Warehouse Arts District, both of the business parks in Lawrence, um, so I'm doing an initiative to renew for a to alleviate that food desert. Um, other proposed targeted uses are uh, mixed uses for residential, retail, office spaces, and industrial and business development in each of those business parks. Uh, we have some stats on that. A lot like the state, we have 11,000 residents in these two census tracts who stand to benefit from some of the investment through this program. Um, the poverty rate across Lawrence is 21.8%, and in these two tracts, it's 57.5 and 32.1%. So we do see some economic differences between the non-designated and designated areas. Um, as some of you have noted and noticed, if you've been following this program, there are some challenges associated with opportunity zones. Jeff discussed one of them um, in, in some length, which is um, we don't have clear federal guidance. That hearing is on Thursday. I think a, a good group of people are working on getting those things lined up and will be able to advise investors.
semesters a little better as we go forward. Um, folks do raise the concern of gentrification. Um, investment into a low-income area can have the potential to push folks out. I think that it is very important to work with your community groups and your community leaders to address those concerns. Um, I think that they're qualified to address that. And uh, it's important to remember that there also has to be a market for um, those sorts of things. And, um, it is a challenge, but it's something that can be addressed. Um, there are no guarantees with opportunity zones. This is something that, um, <clears throat> as we talk about community involvement, it's necessary to note that um, just because you have an opportunity zone designation does not mean that any opportunity zone funds are going to funnel dollars into your community or your project. Um, you'll need to engage with the program and really promote those projects in order to benefit from it. Um, there's also no guarantee that those investments will be successful. If they are made, it still has to be a good project from the beginning. Um, additionally, it's unlikely that Opportunity Zone funds as equity financing is going to provide full capital stack for any project, so you'll need to combine those projects with um, additional funding sources and incentives. Uh, and in that, idea that there's just one funding source, it's important to also notice that you can use other funding sources and um, there are no limitations on the use of existing programs. Um, to our knowledge, uh, as we go through, there's always a potential that um, you won't qualify for another program um, with your project. But if you are otherwise qualified for another funding program or another incentive, then you can stack that with opportunity zones. Um, uh, we've got some examples. If you're doing a housing project, you can also uh, use the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, work with the Housing Resources Commission. Um, you can get tax increment financing in rural communities, federal historic tax credits. Um, businesses can still utilize uh, promoting employment across Kansas, different training programs. We have um, a good number of programs for workforce development as well. So we have a workforce AIE program, which is workforce aligned with industry demand. As businesses are looking to hire skilled staff, we can pair them with a community college or a training program that will train those folks and get them into those positions. Um, so this is a non-exhaustive list of other potential resources that can be utilized along with opportunity zones. Um, the Department of Commerce does most of those listed under the state and our RPMs. Um, our regional project managers are happy to come out to communities and talk about how this can be utilized in setting up new projects. Um, at the local level, um, you can engage with your community leaders um, to explore some of these. These are um, tax increment financing, higher fees, property tax payment. Um, there are a lot of really smart people in this room who work with those things. I am going to try. Maybe you should talk to Steve Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, beyond identifying those resources, we do want to engage with communities. And I think it's really, really important that folks realize that this isn't a state program. This isn't a federal program. This is a federal tax incentive. Uh, it does currently flow through to your Kansas tax returns, but this is about projects and communities and their priorities and what they're willing to do. So um, some of the strategies that communities can take part in is identifying and educating an ecosystem of players. You need to engage with your stakeholders. If you look around, it's a lot of the folks in this room. Those are your community, um, community chambers of commerce, your developers, your attorneys, your CPAs, your community foundations. Um, and as you educate those people, you can incorporate your priorities and your strategies into an economic development strategy. Um, Lawrence has a you know ongoing project to develop the downtown master plan that's happening right now. I believe there are some housing funds that are being discussed. How we're going to utilize those here in this community. Um, there's a nice economic strategy here in Lawrence, and a lot of priorities already identified. Um, 
you know, if you can reach out and cultivate relationships with potential investors, that's something that we're working at the state level to do as well. Um, we'd like to see some investment come into our opportunity zones, and so we're identifying some of those relationships and we'll make those available to communities who reach out and ask the question. Um, they're also going to be asking us about what projects are available. So if you have a project that you want to find an investor for, let us know. And there's some potential for conveying that information back and forth. Um, and so then, as far as actually getting the projects done, those are strategies. However, um, I think people want to know what they can do. So um, after you leave this room, go and talk to folks about what opportunities those are. Talk to your business partners, talk to your clients, um, talk to your neighbors. If there are projects that you want to see done, if you have been looking for the additional boost in uh, how to make those numbers work, Opportunity Zones are um, a potential to make that investment economically feasible. Um, identifying your stakeholders, hang out, talk to people in the room, talk about what you want to do. Um, this is one listening session. You can organize additional sessions, meet with <coughs> other leaders, meet with your organizations in your neighborhood, meet with your community foundations. There's <coughs> impact dollars out there, there's city dollars out there, there's state dollars out there. Um, identify those resources. You can talk about whether or not you want to establish a fund. I think there's some uh, good debate about whether or not communities should do that, and organizations should do that. Jeff mentioned that a lot of these funds are project specific, so if someone has a specific project, they have a specific investor identified, so it makes sense to funnel those funds through an opportunity zone fund. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't get together with a bunch of folks who want to see a housing project and put together a housing project fund, um, or you want to do workforce. Any sort of key strategy you want to do, if it makes sense for the project, it, it's worth talking about the idea. Um, it's very important to identify opportunities, to utilize opportunity funds, and to see your priorities and your strategies move forward. Um, the last little bit is uh, marketing and pitching your ideas. Uh, we encourage communities to develop what we call a community investment prospectus, which is basically just a catalog of your assets, your priorities, your projects that have been identified. Um, there's examples of different communities doing that. Erie, Pennsylvania has a really great one. Louisville, Kentucky has one. Um, they work with a group called uh, New Localism Advisors to do those. Those have some instruction on how you can engage in that process in your community. And I'm happy to provide that resource if anybody's interested in seeing that. Um, and that's also what we're doing at the state level, working with my sidewalk and the Kaufman Foundation to look at what is existing in Kansas, what the investment potential is, and try to market that out to investors, both locally and on the national scene. So um, as you move forward and learn more about opportunities, it's a super crash course. Um, but as you learn more and want to engage, reach out to your community leaders, reach out to folks in the state, We'll do what we can to get you more information. And I really look forward to seeing what you guys do.